2022 was another wild year for fantasy football. And whether you won a championship or you got sent back to the drawing board, we can always find takeaways to make us better next year. Mike, Nate, and myself are each bringing you three things we learned in 2022 and how we'll be using those things to win in 2023 and beyond. Above all else, I do hope y'all enjoy the video. Please leave a like if you do. Comment down below your thoughts on the video itself and be sure to let us know what you learned in 2022. But hey, with all that said, let's get right to the content you came for. Nate, kicking it to you first, what strategy-based lesson did you learn and how are you implementing that going forward? Yeah, I was already kind of starting the strategy with a lot of my startups this year, starting to look at a more zero RB build when creating my startup drafts. And as we saw this year, you cannot trust your running back depth. It is essentially a myth to have running back depth. In a 12-team league, it is very difficult to have anything more than three running backs you feel confident starting. If you have more than that, you're really in a lucky spot. You're in a great spot. But if you're not, I don't think it's necessarily worth our time and effort to go out there and acquire those running backs to create that running back depth. Because you know that once you're in a league, you have to overpay for running backs if you want to trade for them. Now, if you draft them, you can get value for them. You can get them young and put them on your team. But if you're trying to go out there and acquire running backs, especially top running backs, you always have to overpay for them once people are looking at setting their lineups and scoring fantasy points. Because a lot of teams build their teams around the running back position. But with the inconsistency in health that we've seen recently and also inconsistency in usage as more teams go committee approaches, go more hot hand approaches, you know, I think that the running back position is really one that we need to start devaluing and we need to build our teams around wide receivers. Depth is there in the position. The ceiling is there for a lot of players to take off week to week. You know, we have a lot of players. We have 40 wide receivers, 50 wide receivers that on a week to week basis can put up 15 points. You know, have that kind of potential in their offenses with how the NFL is passing now. The wide receiver talent pool is so much deeper than the running back position. And I know you still have to start two running backs. You might have to start two or three wide receivers. But as long as you have two or three flexes, that's where I want to put my other wide receivers. That's where I want to build my wide receiver depth. It's going to be much easier to acquire flex talent at the wide receiver position than it is the running back position. And therefore, I want a strong core of wide receivers. I want six, seven, eight wide receivers I feel confident, confident about at least having in my flex spot. That way I can know that I have six players in my lineup, five, six players in my lineup that can score me fantasy points. And if I don't have a great running back too, it's not that big of a deal because I have such depth across my lineup. So in a lot of start, you know, 11, 12 lineup leagues, that's where I want my strength to be is the wide receiver position, not the running back position. I'm not going to go out there and try to acquire that depth. I'm going to put my, my efforts into the wide receiver room. So you need plenty of wide receivers, uh, running backs. You can go for them. You can't, but there's other positions too. Mike, what other positions do we need to win or not? Definitely need quarterbacks. But one of the things that I found is that you definitely do not need a league quarterback play to win in a super flex league. It's not easy, but it is doable. So I went into a league this year. It was a startup. And I said, I'm going to punt the year. I'm going to draft lesser quarterbacks and load up on elite talent at other positions. And then obviously as the year went on, I realized, look, these guys that are lesser quarterbacks are actually playing pretty well. But let's talk about my elite level positions first. So Najee Harris, Miles Sanders at running back. Miles Sanders good into the last part of the year. Eagles offense kind of hit a little bit of a stall at the end of the year there. Wide receiver Jamar Chase, Devontae Adams, Terry McLaurin, got Pat Fryermuth, TJ Hawkinson I have in my flex spot. I have that flexibility there. David Montgomery. And then my two starting quarterbacks are Geno Smith and Jared Goff. So this was a conscious decision that I made. Obviously, I'm going to have to do some retooling in the offseason, but the best way to know how to do that is to come to the Dynasty Rewind YouTube channel and our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Dynasty Rewind. I'm going to have some work to do because my other quarterback, I have Skylar Thompson, I have Marcus Mariota. So I'm going to need something, but I'm okay with making those moves. So if you are going to punt the quarterback position in a super flex startup, don't just take best player available. Take elite level talent. Jamar Chase was my first overall pick. I went Jamar Chase and I went Devontae Adams. That was my back-to-back. -back. Then I came back with Najee Harris. So people are like, this dude is crazy. He's going to be last place in the league. I didn't end up winning the league. I also made sure that I was paying attention in season, blah, blah, blah. You guys know all that already. Pay attention, waivers, fab, all that good stuff. So that's what I learned is that you don't need elite level talent at the quarterback position. There's a way to do it. You just have to be very, very 
conscious of how you do it. Well, I agree with your point for sure. And this kind of plays into my next point. The the issue with that, and you've touched on it, is the long-term sustainability of these players. And, and this is why going forward, I want to build my teams around quarterback and tight end along with while building the wide receivers. So this is if I'm in a startup, if I'm you know go heading into a rebuild, I want to focus on the bookends of my roster, at least my starting roster first. And, and reason being, high-end quarterback talent we're seeing is harder and harder to come by. Then tight ends, it's been that way. Having a high-end tight end right now is like gold. I mean, it, it's just impossible to come by having somebody who's regularly scoring, even in the top 12 at quarterback, a tight end, anybody scoring in the top five regularly, somewhat regularly is a tight end one of the year easily. And everybody else is kind of, there's this huge tier of just randomness. Since you typically start less of these guys, even if it's a one quarterback, if it's a super flex, you're starting less of these players. So it's that much easier to get a positional advantage down the road. And the other big benefit is their longevity that these guys have. You know, quarterbacks, when you get a good one, if you can start with a Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen, you don't have many complaints going forward. I mean, your you're, you're you're quarterback one, at least, is locked down for hopefully another decade at the minimum. That That's the dream, at least. You know, assuming, assuming the league lasts that long, but also the fact that these guys are still high-end scorers right now. Tight end, same kind of deal. I don't know if I want to start a team with Kelsey right now mm. um that's kind of a you know a question because i don't want to bank on him being done though because god knows if you try to this year travis kelsey's laughing in your face but it's so much easier to gain a positional advantage at these two positions because you're only starting one or two maximum usually you know one two one to two quarterbacks one tight end whereas with running backs and wide receivers if you have an elite one you can some guys counter sometimes counterbalance that with two decent ones on the other side if your other running back isn't as good same kind of concept with wide receivers. If you have Jamar Chase or Justin Jefferson, but the other guy has three Christian Kirks and your other two wide receivers are trash, at the end of the day, those are going to kind of cancel out. But it's much harder to do that with a more consolidated position like quarterback and tight end. Nate, kicking it to you. I know you kind of have a follow-up discussion here. What do you got? Yeah, you know, and I'm I'm looking at this year and how fantasy points have been scored throughout the year and how dynasty startup value is right now. The quarterback position has essentially become very similar to the tight end position, where if you don't have one of the top six, seven, eight guys, then there is a huge drop off into, okay, I don't feel great about this guy week to week. There's some weeks I feel good about him, but I can't just set him and forget him, you know, at the quarterback position. And in Superflex, when there's only, you know, seven, eight of those guys you can set and forget, that position really becomes an advantage, not only just on a week to week fantasy scoring basis, but also just you don't have to go out there and try to acquire the quarterback position. You don't have to worry about trying to make up for the depth there, make up for fantasy points you might be losing in a super flex spot. So I think the quarterback position, now that top tier, it just has an extra added value to it that it might not have had before, where that gives you the positional advantage that the Mark Andrews, Travis Kelsey, Darren Waller a couple of years ago, TJ Hawkinson recently has been giving you in the tight end position. So the quarterback's at that top level are even more valuable now. And, you know, what we've done over the past couple topics we brought up here is talk about different ways to build a team. And there is no one right way to build a team. There are multiple different ways to build a team. What we're telling you is essentially you just need to pick a direction to move your team. If you're out there building your team without any direction, that's how you get stuck in the middle of nowhere. That's how you get stuck finishing fourth, fifth, sixth, and not making it past the first round of the playoffs. You need to pick a direction for your team, whether that's building around the wide receivers and, and you know letting the running backs fall where they may. Maybe it's bookending your team, like Bob said, and creating really good quarterback room, really good tight end room. Maybe it's putting your assets elsewhere and just getting the one-year rental like Mike is at the quarterback position. All of these ways can work. You just have to commit to a strategy with your with your build. I think that's what's important. You can't, like you are saying, you can't just set it and forget it. You got to always be active. You always have to be looking to make moves. It's really important to do those things. And that's why I'm always looking to turn over the bottom end of my roster. These are guys that they're not going to help me other than being placeholders on my bench. So if people are interested and I can move and upgrade player wise or draft capital wise, especially now in the off season, those are moves that you have to make. You're not setting a lineup until September. And I want, to, I want to make this point. A lot of people will use the tactic in the offseason of you only have one starting running back. You only have two starting wide receivers. I have eight months until I have to set a lineup. 
Okay. So do not let people using that tactic against you work. Do not let it work. Say, I got plenty of time to start my line to set my lineup. I'm not making that move. It doesn't work for me right now. We can revisit it at a later time, but always be churning the bottom end of your roster. And if you see a guy that looks like he's going to get replaced, hello, Isaiah Pacheco, get him out of there, get some draft capital in turn. So speaking of turning over the bottom end of your roster to upgrade in other areas. This is a strategy I kind of picked up over this season that I'm going to definitely use going forward. And that's to stop holding injured players when you have a competitive roster. Otherwise, if you lose a star player, it's not time to call it a day. If your roster is ready to win right now, if you're winning games with that player, you can probably still win games without that player. And Brees Hall, Javante Williams, Kyle Pitts, all prime examples of guys that if they got hurt and you were relying on them, I hope you weren't relying on Kyle Pitts. If you were relying on those guys and they got hurt, they didn't help you win a championship on your IR. And maybe you still won one anyway, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. At the end of the day, stop over romanticizing building for the future when you have movable assets and a strong roster to go along with it. It's okay to move pieces that aren't helping you this season. And especially when that championship and the playoffs are in sight, all waiting on the player to get healthy does is shorten the win now window you're in. We always want to talk about, oh, I want to win now forever. I want to win forever. I want to have players on my roster that are going to be good forever. Players on your roster now that are championship worthy are only going to be championship worthy roster pieces for a handful of time. You're wasting those players if you're just holding this spot and hoping you can piecemeal it together with. Dante Foreman, who was fine, and Rex Burkhead of the world, you know, not so much this last year, but the previous year. While you can make that work, you know, especially with a case like Brees Hall and Javante Williams, they were both guys when they got hurt. I moved moved off because they were not helping me anymore this year. Those Both of those moves helped me win championships and that I might not have won if I had not made those moves, if I would have just sat on the points I was getting and not being aggressive. I think that's something as dynasty players that is really hard to kind of make the move to get over because yeah, of course I want Brees Hall on my roster forever. If I drafted him or traded for him, you know, and I think it doesn't, you know, well, if you had Brees Hall, you were drafting one one you obviously weren't a good team. Not every one one is rostered or owned or by the team that was the worst team in the league last year. I had him on a lot of roster because I traded for the one one before it was the one one but the concept remains the same. When you have an injured player, all waiting on that player to get healthy does is short in the window, win now window that you happen to be in. And you might miss out on a championship for it. So just go out and win. Make the moves you have to. Nate, back to you. Speaking of making the moves you have to, sometimes you're not trying to win because you, you know that your roster can't win right now. And you're looking towards the future. You might only be looking towards next season. You might be looking two years down the road, depending on your roster makeup. But Something that is important, no matter if you're looking down the road or if you're you're looking at this season coming up or the season that you know that you're currently in, it is so valuable as a dynasty player to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the upcoming draft classes. And this is why I tell everyone you should you know you should have some kind of you should have some kind of grasp on what's going on in college football and what people are saying for the NFL draft class of the 2024 class, the 2025 class already, because. You're using those picks. You can trade for 2025 picks now. You've already probably traded for 2024 picks. And yes, they're going to be valuable no matter what, but what positions are going to be valuable? As we see this year, right now, the quarterback position is not super valuable. Last year, we saw the quarterback position not be super valuable in the draft class. This so more than last year. And the wide receiver position, after the first one or two guys, where is the the top talent that we saw last year? Each draft class is different. Each draft class is its own. And understanding the strengths of the classes, and you never know because sometimes guys go back, sometimes you know they don't declare, sometimes they do declare. But we do have a basic idea of you know the top guys who are going to declare and where the strength is. If I really need a top top quarterback for my future, this year is a decent year to get it. But I might even be better off next year going after that. The wide receiver position, I knew last year was the year to retool wide receiver core because of the wide receiver talent in last year's class. This is not the class to do it. Sure, there's talent at the top, and I like the depth, but if you want to pick up three, four wide receivers to really remake your team, last year was the year to do it. This year is the year to do it with running backs. So understanding each draft class and the strengths that they have ahead of time really helps you plan out, hey, I know that, hey, I got running backs like Alvin Kamara, you know, Aaron Jones, you know, if I'm looking at my team two years ago, I had these guys on my team. I love having them on my team, but I know by the time that 2023 season comes around, they're not going to be as valuable. 
But if I loaded up on 2023 first round picks two years before time, I knew that as those guys were falling off my roster, I could bring new young talent in like Bijan Robinson, Jameer Gibbs, Sean Tucker, Tank Bigsby. These guys, this is why you need to understand where the future is so that you can start that two to three year plan. And you need to always have that two to three year plan for your dynasty team. Of course, we want to focus on winning this season, but you need to have the next two or three years in mind at all times to make sure that you're keeping that longevity of your roster. I do want to touch on that real quick before we kick the mic. A, I love that point. The the prepping ahead to be able to kind of su- supplement your draft pick to be your replacement for your running back mm-hmm. ahead of time when you know, hey, the cliff is probably coming. I need to be ready for it. I also think another point of this, and this would be more for the competitive teams than, um, you know, teams that are looking to rebuild, is this year right now, and we discussed this in our mock draft yesterday, the 2023 draft is looking like it might be the biggest bamboozle of dynasty of all time because everybody was buy, buy, buy in. And now if you bought in and, and you're in the first round, you're you're still OK. You know, we we still agree there's good talent there. But it taps out a lot quicker than I think a lot of people were expecting. And I think that's just something that kind of naturally happens. So I think you just need to have that wherewithal to chill out, not put all your eggs in one basket. But also, as a competitive team, if you have a grasp that 2023 is the year, 2024 is the year, and you can trade picks out ahead of time, that's where you make moves to deal away your shiny toys before they have a chance to depreciate in value. We do discuss that. Most 99.99% of the time, those picks accrue in value. But now with this 23 class, if Quentin Johnson goes back, if Kendra Miller goes back, if Jordan Addison goes back, if CJ Stroud goes back, this class lost four first round talents in rookie drafts. Kendra Miller's fringe, but and Zach Charbonnet hasn't declared either for God knows what reason. Absolutely know what's ahead, but use it to your advantage to your need. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is kind of goes along with making that two to three year plan that you always discuss, Nate, that timeline. How can you bend future drafts to your will? Do you need picks in that draft to replace players or do you need to move picks to win now and set yourself up for a little bit longer run that you might be in? It's all about playing the future to your will and bending it to your will. Speaking of bending things to your will, Mike, I don't know what kind of segue this is, but here you go. <laughs> You're up. I tried to think these guys are going to be fantasy relevant because they're so good and then they end up not being. So for me, I need to make sure that, you know, I stop holding on to guys that have no hope. I'll give you a prime example of a lot of people doing this. Ian Thomas is one example. Like we held that hope for how many many years and doing a little bit of a self audit. I have to stop holding out for your LaMichael P. Ryan's, your Kenny Yaboas, your Kylan Hills, your Jay Sternbergers, you know, and I've stopped doing that stuff. And it's okay if they're taxi eligible, you can just stash them down there and kind of forget about it. But that's about where it's going to end for me. I have to realize if the NFL doesn't see it, I have to stop seeing it. And I always say the NFL doesn't care about your fantasy team. You have to go off what they do. So again, doing a self scout here, that's one thing that I've learned. And when I stopped doing that, I've become better off because of it. Bob and I were talking before this recording and 2022 was one of my most successful fantasy seasons at two championships. That's it. Stop hanging on to guys that really don't have any help hope. And again, let the NFL dictate to you how to properly value a fantasy player. Yep. Okay? I think that's something that really gets swept under the rug because as fantasy players, we try to do the square peg round whole thing. Like this guy's elite. He's going to go here. Isaiah Spiller's one example of that last year. So learn from what the NFL tells you. Learn from the past. You're doomed to repeat it. Bob, are you going to close this out now? Yes, I will close this right. out. The last point I have, and this is probably what I attribute most to my successful season. And I, I as well had one of my most successful seasons this year. And, and this is what I attribute most of it to is stop messing around with building for the future. Go win it for once. And I think you know, we as fantasy players, we always romanticize draft capital and players that aren't even in the league yet. And, you know, I always promote go build up a draft pool, go get assets and all these things, which is great. You know, absolutely do that. But don't be fixated on building through the draft. You know, Nate, we we touch on it in uh, the, the dominate the offseason video where it feels better if you draft an elite talent because it's like a homegrown feeling. And I'm like, the best feeling to me is winning once you've made this draft pool and you're in season and you have a relatively competent roster of good players and then you have this big draft pool full of assets that 
is just honestly kind of collecting dust. Go use that because you get to play the game of you know who's good now. Once we're in the season, it's a lot easier to pick out, well, this guy's good. That guy's good. I can get both of these guys with these picks. And then just go get those players, run your league. And it's not always that easy because injuries happen, things like that. You know, I wouldn't make these moves early in the season. Make them later if you can, just because, you know, you're offering yourself less time to go trade for Brees Hall after week three. And then he gets it goes and tears his ACL in week six or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just offering yourself a little more flexibility on who your pool is to choose from. But I think far too often, you know, we get enamored with the long term image. And the thing is, is some of those teams, there's one of those teams where I have one third round pick next year now. I don't have any 23 draft capital, but I have guys like CeeDee Lamb, Josh Allen, Chris Olave, who's not, you know, super young or who's not, who is young, but isn't like a top tier talent yet. I have J.K. Dobbins. And then I have some older guys that I have to find new homes for. Alan Kamara, Tyreek Hill, people like that. But I also have Mark Andrews and some other pieces. And then I have other rosters where I still have draft capital kicking around. And I, I have the one-on-one in the league I won the championship in. And, and it's just like, you know, and, and the, coming into that season, I had four first-round picks, I think five second-round picks. But I just went and said, no, I'm not going to just roll through the league and do whatever. I'm going to go build this roster to win and compete now. And, you know, next year kind of be damned for a second, you know, and worry about next year, next year. I think that's a powerful strategy, especially when you don't sell all of your assets like I did in one league. I do think that once you stop over romanticizing the future, and that doesn't mean just build your team around old dudes. Don't make your team look like a retirement home or anything like that, but be selective, you know, have young building blocks and then go get the aging assets that are still putting up elite points that people who might have thought they were a winning team coming into the season have a rough first few weeks. And it's like, I think as dynasty players, I think there's a fine line to walk between selling out early. Nate, you always say you want to be the first one to rebuild. Yep. I think there's a fine line between trying to give it one more week, seeing what happens and kind of building off that and just being like, oh, I'm two and two. I can't win this year. You know, and, and I, I think there's a pretty fine line between those two things. And I think yep. as dynasty players, we this is a long term game for us. We want to build for, for forever but we also want to win a championship someday. Well, that is it for the video today. I do hope y'all enjoyed. Please leave a like if you did. Comment down below your thoughts on the video itself. Like I asked before, what did you learn in 2022 and how are you going to use that to win in 2023 and beyond? If you want to learn more about these strategies as we learn them ourselves, be sure to hop over to patreon.com forward slash dynasty rewind and get in our community discord server where we've already talked these strategies over a ton over there. And lastly, if you want to dominate your offseason, there's two ways you can do that. First, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing when it comes to rookie drafts or any other strategy we discuss this off season and secondly be sure to check out the video on your screen now where we discuss how to dominate your off season in your dynasty leagues but hey that's going to be it for us today we will see y'all in the next one but until then y'all have a good one